Welcome to Bucket List Bars, historic saloons, pubs, and dives of America. Today, we're in Chicago, one of the most storied cities in our nation. And when you think about Chicago, one of the first things that comes to your mind is probably prohibition. That's right. This city became synonymous with organized crime, bootlegging, and shootouts during the 1920s. It was home to Al Capone, Public Enemy Number One, Bugs Moran, and countless speakeasies. And it's those speakeasies we're going to focus on today. In doing our documentaries, we run into bars that were speakeasies, bars that are old neighborhood hangouts, and bars which for some reason are the last of their kind. And it's rare to find all three in the same place. But that's exactly what we found at our first stop in the Windy City, the Green Door Tavern. We came here to get a sense of the history of old time Chicago, and that's exactly what we got. The Green Door Tavern sits at 678 North Orleans Street, just a building away from Mr. Beef. To find out more about the Green Door Tavern, we sat down with the manager and co-owner, Jeff Lynch. The Green Door Tavern is the uh, last freestanding wood structure in downtown Chicago. Um, it was built after the fire of 1872 and then before the ordinance it said, no more freestanding wood structures. We're going to pause here and consider this for a moment. In 1871, a fire started in a barn under mysterious circumstances on DeCoven Street. Virtually every building in the city was made of wood which had become bone dry because of a drought. The fire raged through Chicago for two days, destroying over 17,000 buildings, killing 300 people, and leaving 100,000 homeless. The city soon after instituted an ordinance forbidding wooden buildings in Chicago. The Green Door Tavern is a legacy to that history, seen in its rafters and its peculiar lean. The building's racking, or lean, is a bit unnerving when you first see it, but it's been like that for over 100 years, so there's little chance it'll actually fall in on you. Now, on to the speakeasy. It started off as a grocery store, and then, uh, and then an Italian restaurant, which um, was when they put the speakeasy downstairs. It was Vito Giacomino who opened the Huron Orleans restaurant in 1921. He passed it on to his children, Jack and Nello, who, shortly afterwards, opened the speakeasy in the basement. The rumor is that the speakeasy was run by the Northside Gang, and specifically, Dean O'Banion. Dean O'Banion was an Irish-American mobster and bootlegger in Chicago during Prohibition and was a bitter rival of Al Capone's Chicago outfit. As head of one of the most powerful mobs in Chicago, O'Banion had a number of speakeasies around the city selling his illegal alcohol, including the Green Door Tavern, so named because of its notable green entrance. Jeff took us down to the speakeasy to show us what we missed during what were probably the darkest years of U.S. history. Well, at least to us anyway. The room is surprisingly small, but it has everything one could want, if one couldn't drink in public, that is. They rent the speakeasy out for private parties, and it is perhaps the ultimate man cave. The circus canvases are original and were found in the speakeasy. End of note is the handsome bar, which as it turns out, was a Brunswick that was originally upstairs, but moved downstairs a long time ago. Okay, let's try for a moment to put all that history aside and look at what the Green Door Tavern is today. It's just... It's a nice neighborhood bar in the middle of downtown Chicago that doesn't have a neighborhood bar feel, you know? We do. We've heard nothing but good things about the chili and the burger, and from the old wall-mounted menus still strewn throughout the place, we knew that both had been Green Door Tavern staples for some time. And so when we walked into the kitchen, we planned on trying them. We really did. But then we tried the corned beef, and we haven't really been the same since. The Green Door Tavern also features a specialty drink that is reflective of its speakeasy roots, the French 75. This. There you Just go. a touch, Jim. Just a touch. About an ounce and a half. Might be a little more like two on that one. And then we're going to top it with a little simple syrup and sour mix. Just simple about syrup and sour. Yes. And then you top it off with champagne. The drink was first made in 1915, but brought to the U.S. in 1930. It was named for the French 75mm howitzer, which is what it's supposed to kick like, and it does. But as good as the French 75 is, we had to try a local specialty. You see, the Green Door, like every other bar in Chicago, also serves a liqueur called Malort. It tastes like, well, here's Derek's first try of the drink. Just nasty. A sipper. <laughs> That's nasty. <laughs> Disgusting. Oh. <laughs> the place is hands down one of our favorite places. From the knickknacks and the decor lining every square inch of the building 
to the leaning doorway and the speakeasy. There isn't anything about this place that isn't at the same time oozing great history and also utterly cool. So go get a Reuben and a French 75. Watch the game and just let your eyes soak in all the memorabilia a place like this collects over a century. Or better yet, find an excuse to rent out the speakeasy in the basement and get a few shots of Malort. Despite the aftertaste, it'll be worth it if it's at the Green Door Tavern. Since we're in Chicago, we thought it'd be fun to talk about one of the most notorious bartenders that ever mixed a drink. His name was Michael Finn, but his friends, they all called him Mickey. Finn was an all-around ruffian and ne'er-do-well. He spent his early years as a thief and a pickpocket. He was particularly adept at hanging out in bars, waiting for customers to get good and sauced, and then mugging them on their way home. In 1896, Finn upgraded to a new, nobler position when he became the bartender and proprietor at the Lone Star Saloon and Palm Garden Restaurant on South State Street, affectionately called Whiskey Row by the papers of the time. The place was just another grimy, flea-infected Chicago watering hole until about 1898. That's when Finn, always on the lookout for new ways to commit crime, met up with a local scoundrel called Dr. Hall, who sold Finn some brown bottles filled with mysterious white powder or liquid. The stuff was never identified, but it was thought to be something called chloral hydrate, billed as a sedative. And boy was it. For the next five years, the Lone Star Saloon and Palm Garden restaurant, already known as the roughest bar in the city, would get even more dangerous. When a patron entered who looked like he might have something worth stealing on him, Finn would slip him some of his sedative into the drink. Eventually, the patron would pass out, and when he did, Finn and some of the people who worked there would take him into a back room, strip him, rob him, and then dump his naked body back in the alley. When the patron finally came to around 12 hours later, they'd have no memory of the night's events or how they got there. Finn kept up this racket until 1903, when he was finally caught and the bar was shut down. But, thanks to accounts in the press about his deeds, the act of putting knockout drops into someone's drink would forever be known as slipping them a mickey. And it all happened here in Chicago. Our next visit continues to explore Chicago's speakeasy past. But this one wasn't run by an Irish or Italian immigrant. It was run by a Swede. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, over 1.3 million people emigrated from Sweden to the U.S. While some chose to move out west and settle the land, some remained in the cities. Of the cities they settled in, more of them ended up in Chicago than any other. As most people do when they settle a new place, they build something familiar. For the Swedes, it was a suburb on the outskirts of the city called Andersonville. Across from the Swedish American Museum, and facing a water tower emblazoned with the Swedish flag, is a neon herring holding a martini. This is the legendary Simon's Tavern. For at least 78 years, Simon's has sat at the same address, at 5210 North Clark Street in Chicago. It's actually been there longer, as we'll find out, just in a slightly different location and under another name. To learn about its extensive history, we caught up with Simon's owner, Scott Martin, who'd planned on taking his daughters to the shore for the day, but showed up to give us a tour of the place instead. So this is Simon Lundberg. He was the guy who founded this business. He immigrated to America from Smolensk, Sweden, early 1900s. He joined the American forces during the First World War as to become a citizen of the country. War ended. Uh, he went to Colorado, worked for the railroad, uh, saving his money always in hopes of having his own business in the States someday. In 1922, he, other people from Smolensk and parts of Sweden were moving to this area of Chicago. So with the money he saved, he came and opened up a little cafe down on Berwyn Street, which was called the Berwyn Food Shop. This happens also to be prohibition, and a couple of gentlemen came in one day and sat at the counter and ordered coffee. As the coffee arose, one of the guys took something out of his coat, poured it into the coffee, and slid the coffee cup to Simon, suggesting he try it. So Simon took the coffee and went, ooh, that's some pretty good whiskey. And the guy said, we can get your regular supply, we'll put word on the street, nobody will bother you. According to rumors, Simon was buying from the Chicago outfit, Al Capone's group. Whether or not that's true, we don't know. But what we do know is that at one point Simon figured out that the whiskey by itself was more profitable than the whiskey and coffee, and so did what any 1920s entrepreneur would do. He opened a speakeasy. So as you come into this part of the basement, this is the room that was the speakeasy. You can see it's the only part of the basement with a ceiling in it. And you see how they plastered over the brick? And rose mauling is a Scandinavian stenciled artwork where you blend watercolors or acrylics in, in stencil. Mm -hmm. But you can see this very simple decoration that was down here. Mm -hmm. All right, so just that, and you can see how it runs along, it runs along the wall over right, here. Right, right. The first time Scott was down here was in 1994, when Simon's son, 
Roy, was showing them around in the hopes of selling the place to Scott. Needless to say, Scott was a bit surprised. Another artifact left from Simon Lundberg's tenure as owner is the huge canvas mural surrounding the walls opposite the bar. This mural is a result of the love for the outdoors by Simon and many of his customers. And, and the thing about all these guys who were hanging out, they were avid sportsmen, they would go hunting all the time, and that's when we come to the mural on the wall here. So a lot of these guys by the 40s had bought some property up north, up in Michigan, and they would go hunting. Uh, the last weekend of the deer hunting season, they would have a big party called the Deer Hunter's Ball. And that is the title of this mural. This was painted by an artist named Sig Olson. He was also from Smolin. In 1949, the men and women who were up there, right, and the kids, they had this big party called the Deer Hunter's Ball. And somebody took a photograph. In 1950, Sig Olson got a hold of the photo and took it home. And in the course of six years, in his basement, painted this and presented it to the bar as a gift in 1956. A particular interest to visitors is the fact that there are five hidden animals in the mural. If you can find them, you get to play Viking for the night. After Prohibition mercifully ended, Simon opened his bar full time. When he did, he wanted to give his customers something different. Now at that time, as he started construction of the bar, his idea is because in the media, there's a whole bunch of attention being paid to a ship being built in France called the Normandy. And this was gonna be the first three stack ship, the most grandiose ship of its era. So Simon decides, I'm gonna build a bar that'll feel like one on the Normandy. Obviously, people in this community would never be able to afford to go on the Normandy, but he could then come in here and kind of see what the rich people experience. So this is the Normandy etched in the mirrors above each register here. Um, you see the portholes in the back bar. All the woodwork is cut curved and round, so giving it a nautical feel. And all the way, even the drink rail here, you can see it's a 60-foot long mahogany bar built out of three pieces of wood. It's all original, um, so you have a 35-foot piece, a 20-foot piece, and a 5-foot piece at the end here. So now the reason, uh, like I said, was people could come in here and kind of feel like the rich people. In addition to being a speakeasy and being modeled after one of the most luxurious ships of all time, Simon's Tavern also served as the neighborhood bank. Another thing he did while constructing the bar was he built a bank in the bar. If we remember 1929, the stock market crashed, the banks had lost everybody's money. 1934 is here, people are getting jobs again, but people have such distrust for the banks, they're cashing their check in the neighborhood, butcher shops, shoemakers, those kinds of places. But those places were also taking a percentage of the paycheck for the risk of cashing it. Well, Simon being grateful to the people of the community who had been buying whiskey and his coffee, he said, you come here on Friday, cash your check, I'll have a free sandwich for you and I won't take none of your money. So this is the bank that he built over here. This is all bulletproof for that era. This door weighs over 300 pounds and is lined with three panes of bulletproof glass and 12 gauge steel. And you could see from the side, the, the glass, and then the, you could feel the weight of the door without, don't get your finger caught in there though, because it'll just Holy cut it. And as we go into here, you can see the whole outside wall to the bar is also lined with 12 gauge steel. So standing inside here, he was completely safe. He opened up the bar May of 34, and by December of 1934 was cashing over $14,000 worth of people's payroll checks every Friday in this bar. Look, there is just too much history here to fit into this video. Like the classic and iconic logo of the bar, a play on the Scandinavian love of pickled herring. Get it? It's a herring drinking a martini. Or the myriad of pictures in the back that showed Simon Lumberg's life in black and white or the ghost story that relates to the Hunter's Ball mural across from the bar. And on and on. You've got to just come down here yourself to find out this history firsthand. Ask Scott for the nickel tour, and ask him what his two secret glog ingredients are. Before moving on to our next speakeasy, we wanted to spend a few alcohol-soaked minutes talking about that hellspawn of concoctions, Malort. <laughs> now, we saw what this stuff will do to you when we visited the Green Door. <coughs> but what exactly is this stuff, and why does it elicit such a reaction, even in the most hardened drinkers? This vile drink was created in the early 20th century by a Swedish immigrant to Chicago named Carl Jepsen, who apparently had no taste buds. The word malort translates literally to moth herb, and it's the Swedish name for wormwood which is what's used to flavor this stuff, much like the other famous wormwood drink, absinthe. Malort gained a popular following in Chicago after Prohibition and became known as a drinking man's drink. Most of its advertising focused on its niche popularity and practically challenged people to try it, suggesting that only quote-unquote real drinkers would like it. So what does this stuff taste like? 
It, it tastes like a combination of grapefruit juice and bile. Um, <laughs> it's just horrible. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I think it tastes like a rotten grapefruit. Look, this stuff is as terrible as they say, but it's also a Chicago tradition. It's only made and sold in this one city in the entire world. You owe it to yourself to try a shot when you visit, but be sure to have your camera ready so you can take a snap of your very own Malort face. I would have to. Everyone has their own opinion on what it tastes like, but... Our final stop on this tour of Chicago takes us to one of the most storied jazz clubs we've ever been to. We usually start these clips with a backstory, something historical that is somehow connected to the bar we're about to visit for the next 10 minutes or so. But here, we find it's impossible. There's simply too much, and we really didn't know where to start. We're visiting the Green Mill Jazz Club in uptown Chicago. The Green Mill Jazz Club sits at 4802 North Broadway in one of the most acclaimed areas of old Chicago. It's actually just steps away from the two most important and famous music venues in Chicago's history, the Uptown Theater and the Riviera. To set the stage for the Green Mill story, we're going to start with manager Jason Cole and let him lead us through time while sitting in Al Capone's personal booth. Yeah, Green Mill's been here since 1907. It was originally a place called Pop Morris's Roadhouse. It was just a little stop-off place as people were going to the cemetery mm -hmm. behind us. And um, the idea was that they, was the as Uptown was becoming the up-and-coming entertainment district in Chicago, they wanted a place like, um, like the Moulin Rouge. The Moulin Rouge in Paris opened in 1889 as an early nightclub, and as the birthplace of the Can-Can, it was known for its excesses, like flowing champagne in the evenings, and dancing girls in titillating costumes. It was perhaps the most successful nightclub in history, and now Chicago was to have its very own. The only problem was the name, Moulin Rouge. It means Red Mill. And for some reason, that wasn't a name they could use. Now, the red light district wasn't too far from here, so they wanted to distance themselves from the red light district in title, so they changed red to green, and hence the Green Mill. The original Green Mill Gardens was contained in the entire red brick building, and the one where the Uptown Theater is now located. As Jason said, it contained a huge ballroom, or garden, dancing, live music, lounges, and even a restaurant. The original entrance to the Green Mill Gardens can still be found today. Look for the windmill and the granite above the entrance currently to a Mexican restaurant. After the passage of the Volstead Act and Prohibition in 1920, the Green Mill Gardens became unsustainable and all but the current lounge was closed. But that doesn't mean the Green Mill died like so many other places. In fact, it had the help of a certain notorious leader of the Chicago mob. Well, sort of. Not necessarily Al Capone. It was partially owned and managed by a guy named Machine Gun Jack McGurn. It's not his real name, he was, a, it was a boxer, he was an Italian guy, in with the mob, but uh, when he was a boxer, he was nicknamed Machine Gun, or his fast punches, but uh, he, uh, he operated this place. To put it mildly, Machine Gun Jack McGurn was a rotten human being. He was one of Capone's top men, and the only man to stand trial for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And if that wasn't enough, he was also a ruthless businessman when it came to running the Green Mills Entertainment. There was a guy, uh, there was a singer, a famous singer named Joey e. Lewis, who used to sing here, and he was the biggest nightclub singer in the country at the time. And uh, he was a favorite of Al Capone's. Um, uh, he was making more money in clubs than anybody else, like singing, really popular. Uh, he told Machine Gun Jack McGurn, he's like, look, I, uh, I'm gonna open my own place. I'm going in with this guy, and I wanna open a place called The Rendezvous. And, um, you know, it's no hard feelings, and McGurn told him, it's like, no, you're not leaving the Green Mill. You'll never live to open this other place if you leave. And um, he did it anyway, he left. And uh, he opened the rendezvous. And uh, it was like a week later, um, some guys busted into his hotel room, stabbed him multiple times, cut his throat, cut off part of his tongue. Uh, he ended up surviving. And um, it took him years to learn how to speak again. And after he learned to speak, he became a stand-up comedian. <laughs> We'll go from the screens of Rigoletta back to the screens of Rigamortis. Obviously, things have changed a lot since the days of Capone and McGurn, but what hasn't changed is the mill's reputation as a top-notch jazz club. By looking at the place, you'd think it was still a speakeasy, with the paneled paintings lining the wall, 
the green velvet lined boots, and the immaculate bar. It seems like nothing's changed, and Al Capone himself could come through the door at any minute. Something else we asked Jason about is a signature cocktail. The Green Mill sells more Malort than anywhere in the world. Oh. Um, and we're quite proud of that. Uh, yeah, so a shot of Malort is something that uh, we're, pers we're, we're pretty well known for. And uh, I discovered that Jägermeister and, and Malort uh, are actually pretty good together. Because really? Jäger is so sweet yeah. and the Malort is so bitter and that the, actually the two of them combined taste surprisingly mild. It's a, uh, it's interesting. Like, uh, yeah, you'll do one with me before you get out of here. Never one to shy away from a new way to drink alcohol that, well, I don't really like, just to make sure that I don't really like it. I jumped at the chance to try Jason's concoction, known from now on as the Green Mill. So, is there a Green Mill toast? Um, not officially. Well, you're a bartender. I'll let you. Uh, uh well. <laughs> Up the Queen is as close as we get to uh, an official toast. Up the Queen. That's not bad at all. Let's see. So it's got that little bit of that. Yeah, it's still got the, the bitterness aftertaste of the Malort, but uh, cut down significantly. Yeah, like by over half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just to make sure we both knew what it tasted like. Jason volunteered to hold the camera while I tried the green mill. <laughs> it's clear that Jason absolutely loves this place, and who wouldn't? It's got history that other joints would kill for. The decor and setting scream class at every turn. From the legends who've walked through the door, to the living legends that play nightly on the stage. From the bar, to the twinkling lights of the marquee, the green mill is simply a must-see destination. Thanks for joining us on this tour of Chicago's historic pubs. The next time you visit Chi-Town, make it a point to go by and visit them yourself and drink in some history. Join us next time as we explore more of America's historic saloons, pubs, and dives. Cheers. Cheers.